I have been repatriating antiquities as a way to heal my pain and my inability to go back home. I'm the daughter of Andriani and Leonidas Georgiou. At the age of 15, when the Turks invaded, we were all turned into refugees. Let us start off with the most important question of them all. Who is Dasula Hajitofi and what inspired her to dedicate her life to bringing looted artifacts home? Who is Dasula Hajitofi? to me, is very different to who is Tasula Hajitofi to everyone else. I think most of us, we look at identity being equal to nationality, and we believe we have one identity. I think we all have many identities. For example, I am the mother of Andrea Hajitofi, who is a businessman and entrepreneur and found his passion on cars and racing trucks. I'm the mother of Sofia Hajitafi, who is uh, mentally challenged, and she opened the world of care to my family uh, to understand and have sensitivity in another dimension about these special people. I'm the mother of Marina Hajitafi, who is now 22 and is a student in forensic pathology and found her passion in animals. Um, I'm the wife of uh, Michael Hajitofi, who is half Cypriot, half British. Uh, he's an oil and gas negotiator and found his passion in nature and in gardening. But of course, the one you know me of is I'm the daughter of Andriani and Leonidas Georgiou. These two people were born in Mandre Samohos, to a very small village in the occupied part of Cyprus. And um, they moved to Famagusta, to the closed area, or called Ghost City. And uh, we were born there, and at the age of 15, when the Turks invaded, we were all turned into refugees. So who is Tsula? Tsula is a businesswoman today, is an author, but is also that little girl that went to bed one night dreaming of her future, carefree, and woke up in the midst of war and destruction, abandonment, betrayal from in the, the international community as well as within our country. And when people go through such experiences, I think it marks them for life. It certainly marked me for life. And ever since I have been trying to understand that identity of refugee, of displaced person, if we want to be legally correct, being different, and I have been repatriating antiquities as a way to heal my pain and my inability to go back home. So that's who Tasula Hajitofi is. When I began this journey, it was in the late 1980s. Those days we were working with fax. There were no mobile phones almost, uh, certainly not in every house and there was no internet. Also, the occupied area was closed. We had no access. Any information to the occupied area was given to me by uh, friends, Turkish Cypriots, who would come to renew their passports in Holland because I was honorary consul, and I would befriend them and they'll bring information to me. I also befriended um, soldiers from the United Nations. I even christened a couple as Orthodox. So they used to bring information to me, but information about the looting and evidence about the looting. But then, in order to repatriate something, you have to track it down. You have to find out where it is. And in uh, the 80s, uh, even prestigious auction houses 
they were selling uh, antiquities from Cyprus, icons, of course they did. Um, the sensitivity about the value of antiquities to the ordinary citizens, especially in affected communities, was in existence. It is really only since the Iraq and Syrian war that there is a lot more sensitivity and awareness about uh, looted antiquities and their link to other crimes. So once you tracked that antiquity down, you had to do preliminary um, evaluation. First of all, is this authentic or is this fake? If it's authentic, who is the legal owner? Is this a religious antiquity? So does it belong to the Church of Cyprus in our case? And if so, which bishopric, which bishopric area does it belong to? Uh, because you need power of attorney for that specific bishop or you need a power of attorney from the Holy Synod to represent the others. Um, once you have that power of attorney, then you have to intervene. You have the right to intervene to the auction house or you have to, uh, the right to approach a collector or a museum exhibited looted art and make them aware. But nobody is going to give you back something that they paid serious money for to buy or that they are trading unless you have evidence. So then the game begins. In 1997, you coordinated the Munich case, one of the largest art trafficking sting operations in European history since World War II. The case of Munich, people know and it's been in the media more as a James Bond story as to what I did, or which I couldn't do alone, we did, I had help. But my aspiration is now for people to understand why I did it. You know, it wasn't my job to do it. I didn't get up one day and someone told me, go and do it. I want people to understand why I had to do it. But to go back to Munich, in, by 1997, I already began um, court cases on behalf of Cyprus with my hat as an honorary consul of Cyprus representing the government and as a representative of the church worldwide representing the Holy Synod and the Church of Cyprus. So I began court cases in Rotterdam for four icons from the Church of Antiphonites. I began a court case in Japan for the royal doors of Peristerona which were recently brought back. I repatriated without a penny uh, already the Platanistasa icon, the Archangel, which was on loan to the bishopric of Kyrenia. And when 1974 came, it was looted and sent abroad because Platanistasa is not in the occupied area. And I had many cases like that that people just gave me antiquities when I approach them. But by being involved in this area, it didn't only help me to heal my pain and being more and more investigative and using the Turkish Cypriot friends I had to give me information in the UN, I also understood how the trade was done and that they were criminals. And criminals, you know, they, they have no borders. We have them everywhere. So the art trafficking was done by a number of criminals who were basically looting the churches, cutting the frescoes and the mosaics, regardless whether they were 5th century mosaics like the Kanakaria case, and they were taking them abroad. But that exposed to me the entire chain of um, injustice. First of all, in Cyprus, in the occupied area, there were international treaties that Turkey signed to protect cultural heritage in case of war and armed conflict. 
they signed it, Cyprus signed it, you know, but they didn't, you know. We didn't take them to court for that, but um, they allowed this to happen. Um, there were United Nations soldiers there. They watched it, they saw it, they, you know, not very much has happened. UNESCO sent envoys the report of Dalibard in the occupied area in 1976. It was never published because Turkey intervened and said this report was produced after a request from the Republic of Cyprus. We don't recognize it. So it went under the window. So you see, they went through customs. How did they go through customs? Then they went to auction houses unnoticed. People with money, they believed that they could buy them. They had the right to hold an 11th century fresco from a church in their living room if they paid money. The awareness about the immense emotional value that these antiquities had to the ordinary people was not recognized, was not acknowledged. I spoke to the then Archbishop and told him that there were about six steady dealers, controversial dealers, who were all buying from one man, and that was a Turkish national living in Munich, Aydin Dickmann. So this man was the link, he had the contacts in the occupied area, he had strong contacts in Turkey, and he could bring the antiquities to Germany, and then via these five controversial dealers, dish them out to the auction houses where they were sold. So if we were to expose this, we would have to expose these six dealers. And the only way to do it is to befriend one to frame the others. There was a Dutchman, well, still is, uh, Michel von Rijn, who approached me to sell looted uh, mosaics from Kanakaria Church via me to the government before they were sold to Kohlberg in the States, in the, the famous Indianapolis case. I actually started talking to him and collecting information which I deposited to the Attorney General's office at the time and they helped Thomas Klein in the United States, our lawyer, and Michael Kiprianu from the Attorney's office to win the Kanakaria case. It was that same man, Aydin Digman, who sold those and Michel von Ryan was his partner so he actually taught me the game. He told me who was who for his own reasons. So at the end, we had court cases, Cyprus, left and right. And the only way to expose this was to pretend I was to buy antiquities from Dickman and to get the police to catch him red handed. But of course, I didn't, Dickman didn't trust for Ryan. I didn't trust for Ryan. So you have to read the book to get the story, but we basically had to work together for Ryan and me. And I, on behalf of the Church of Cyprus, was pretending to buy these antiquities via Michel and his uh, thugs <laughs> or his friends or whatever they are. And they went to Dickman and I brought Interpol Cyprus police, German police, and they caught them red-handed. In 2011, you founded Walk of Truth, a non-governmental organization whose mission is to engage the public about the importance of protecting and preserving cultural heritage in areas of conflict. We lobby to change the legislation via roundtable debates, and then we try to influence uh, policymakers to adopt new legislation to protect and promote cultural heritage, create a platform of citizens to be active, to watch the trade and give us tips so we can intervene and repatriate. And um, 
building up technologies that we can protect and promote cultural heritage. So this is Walk of Truth and this year we signed um, a Memorandum of Understanding with University College London whereby my archives of the last 35 years will be used and catalogued for training and research purposes. And we are setting a research and innovation center to protect and promote cultural heritage and using the cases of Cyprus as lessons learned for other countries. On the 20th of July, on the day to mark the invasion, Mr. Erdogan visited Cyprus. Without a visa, he just turned up. Mr. Erdogan also announced that he would pray in a mosque in my town, in Famagusta, which was never there before. And I went there to face him because he illegally could build a mosque in my town illegally come to Cyprus and go and pray in his mosque whilst us, the refugees, and all the Cypriot and Christians in this country could not pray in our church in Dimio Stavros or St. Nicholas a bit further down the road because it's looted, destroyed, and there was a fence. Now let me tell you something. I shall not ask permission from Mr. Erdogan or any Erdogan to pray in my church. Every hour I invested in my life fighting for justice for Cyprus, but also making it an example for everyone else worldwide who is in the same position is worth it. If I do not go home, in my lifetime, I shall work until the last day of my breath that Cyprus is an example worldwide how to never do it again.